the book of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, and I'd like to go to Jeremiah 13, if we could, please, and then we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 13 after that, Jeremiah chapter number 13. This is uh, a series that I'm going to continue on the dangers of pride. The dangers of pride. The Bible says, if you're there, uh, let's go ahead and look down at verse number 15. I've already read through this passage, so I'm not going to take the time to go through it again. But um, I'll give you just a verse or two here. Verse 15. Hear ye and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God. Before he causes darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains and while you look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. I'm going to preach on the dangers of pride. What is pride? Well, it's a high or inordinate opinion of one's own dignity or self-worth or importance, merit, superiority, uh, you know, uh, of other above other people and this is why the Bi Bible says so much about pride and the Bible commands us not to think of him ourselves more highly than we ought to think Paul reminded him you know told people he said I'm the chief of sinners and he said I am what I am by the grace of God Amen. pride has many dangers in the sermon series so far, I've taken the time to go through a, quite a few different scriptures on this, but I can summarize the point so far is that pride will lead a soul to damnation and hell for all of eternity. Some people believe, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It is pride to think that you and your good deeds and you and you going to church or being baptized or, or the, doing the seven sacraments will get you into heaven because it never will. The only thing that we can do is come and trust what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But pride will not only destroy. And there's so many people that will have their souls destroyed because they're trusting in a church or a system of works and merit-based type system. And they won't let it go. They won't let it go. And so pride leads to destruction, the Bible says, in a haughty spirit before a fall. The Bible also tells us, and I've dealt with this idea, that pride leads to personal destruction. Pride destroys homes. Pride destroys countries, by the way. And we're in a month in America called Pride Month. And next month, we'll have, celebrate American pride and how we're so much better than every other country. And, and listen, I'm thankful to God uh, for some of the things. But I think we should get rid of that term pride out of our life. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of our country. I'm so proud of this and I'm proud of that. The Bible says that pride goeth before destruction. You know, I'm thankful to God for America and some of the freedoms that we have left. I'm thankful for, to God for America for being able to come to church without being harassed and hindered. I'm thankful to God for America. But I know, I know that destruction's coming upon America because of pride. You think about this month we're in. People are proud. They are prideful. They think they're better than other people. They say, you know what, you know what the Bible tells us? This is what pride does. This is Romans chapter 1. This is, you know why they think they're better? Because they have a sexual deviancy. They like children. They like men and men and women and women and all this kind of weird stuff. They like beasts and all these weird things. And they want to promote that and think that they're better than everybody else when actually the Bible says, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the 
same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They take the rainbow colors uh, that God created when he, when he made it to rain upon this earth, uh, and it began to rain and flooded and drowned everybody on this earth uh, back then because of the judgment of God. And they've taken that symbol of the rainbow uh, that meant that God would not destroy the world through a flood anymore. Uh, and, and it's a symbol of the judgment of God reminding us of the, the, the great worldwide flood when God wiped out all a human civilization. And they've taken that and they've made it into their symbol of uh, deviation and perversion and filth and vileness and all of this. And they're trying to go after the kids with their drag queen story hours, their grooming, and they're, they're hurting people. But, you know, pride, the Bible tells us pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is, uh, is not a virtue. It's not a Christian virtue. And it always tends to destruction. And so we're, I've just been doing this series about pride. And we're going to continue that series today, uh, The Dangers of Pride. Pride, number one, will destroy a soul and send it to hell. Number two, it'll destroy your life. Destroy your life. And you will not be able to, to reach God's full potential for your life. Number three, I'm going to go through a whole bunch that kind of fit under that second point. Uh, but pride brings contention. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd help me as I preach, God. I pray, Lord, that you'd strengthen me as I try to preach your word. I want to say every word that should be said and uh, leave out anything that shouldn't. And I pray that you would guide these words into the hearts of people. Lord, may they get exactly what they need uh, as you guide them in all truth. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pride brings contention. Pride brings fighting. What does it mean to be contentious? The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Uh, what does it mean to be contentious? contentious? Well, it's one who likes to argue, debate, strive, or quarrel. Somebody who likes to fight. But in Proverbs 26, 4, it gives us an interesting uh, conundrum here. The Bible says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. And in verse 5, it says something seemingly contradictory, showing, but I believe this shows that there needs to be some wisdom in how we are to answer people. Uh, it, it is different in different situations. The Bible says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. There are fools that are wise in their own conceit. And so sometimes we, we, uh, it's better to just let it lie and, let, you know, and just let the fool say what he's going to say and don't even sink down to his level, don't get involved with it. And then other times that, you know, being led by the spirit, we need to go ahead and just let them have it and show them uh, that, you know, hey, look, this is wrong. You got the wrong attitude because they're puffed up in their ignorance and their conceit here. And, but I want you to understand uh, contention is one, a contentious person is one who loves that and feeds on that. And we need to be careful. That's, that's a prideful thing. Some people uh, care so much about being right that they could never Never change their opinion about something, even if they are con given uh, facts and reason uh, to change their attitude or change their mind on that matter. The Bible, and they'll die on that hill. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14, the beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water, therefore leave off contention before it be meddled with. The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. So leave it off. Leave off contention. What does the Bible say about contentiousness? Well, it is better to dwell in a wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Amen. So there's some women just like to fight. He said just it, it'd be better to be by yourself in a wilderness than with a, an angry, contentious woman. In Proverbs 26, 21, it says, As coals are to the burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Somebody who just likes to fight you know what? A lot of that time, I believe it's because of pride and they like to just stir it up. Sometimes they just throw it out there and they just want to see, a, see an argument. They want to argue. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 26, 21, the words of a talebearer are as wounds and they go down to the inward part of the belly. That's the next verse. So some people just, they, they're prideful. They go around sharing stories and different things that, that seem to belittle somebody else and so forth and they hurt people. 
Well, the Bible says this in Proverbs 27, 15, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. A contentious woman, a woman who just wants to fight, wants to argue, wants to, to bicker and all of this kind of thing. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 2, verse 8, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. He says, listen, there are some people out there that just want to fight. They want to argue and they do not the truth. So what does it mean here? Pride, bring, only by pride cometh contention. Only by pride. You see a, a, a fight going on. Maybe somebody's pride has been, you know, attacked and they have to defend that pride by, by that position. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen. 16, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. What are some examples of, of pride being, bringing contention? Well, turn over to Isaiah 14. I mean, the greatest example I can think of is Lucifer, you know, being cast out of heaven. You know, he said five times, I will, and I'm going to do all these things. Isaiah 14, verse number 12. And by the way, we believe that, that Lucifer was a leader among the angels. He was uh, in charge of the music and so forth. There's indication of that. But he thought of himself more highly than he ought to think. Listen to what he says. Uh, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, verse 12, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation. In the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now, Lucifer has never been cast into hell. That, that is future in the book of Revelation. That's coming, okay? But Lucifer's pride led him to rebel against God. He was cast out into the earth, okay? And he's the prince of the power of the air, and he's, the, he's considered the little G God of this world who is out there blinding the minds of them that believe not. And so he's out there deceiving people, and, uh, and he's pridefully uh, going, even though it is written that he will be destroyed, he is pridefully going around deceiving people and getting people to go against God. But his what was it that led him to rebel against God? You know, the Antichrist, which will, you know, it seems like he'll be uh, embodied, uh, you know, basically, you know, uh, the Lucifer uh, possessing so forth his body. He's going to, at the abomination of desolation, he's going to basically go into the temple, uh, I believe a rebuilt temple, and he's going to declare himself to be above all that is called God. And an ultimate blasphemy. And so it's the same thing that's going on. And there are going to be people who pridefully believe in him. And by the way, I think that's going to be a Jewish Messiah, right? He's going to claim to be the lineage of David. And I think they're going to, they're going to, they're going to be worshiping him. They're going to be looking to him and so forth. And uh, he, that's why he's going to, uh, you know, basically he's, he makes a covenant and then he allows the, the uh, you know, at the midst of the week, he stops the, the sacrifices uh, and he begins um, <clears throat> at that midst of the week. He, I believe he says, look, you don't have to do that. I am, you know, just, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one. He reveals himself to be that and all the sacrifices and so forth uh, are done away with at that point. Anyway, side note there, but this is the pride, the pride. And we, if we fall, if we start being prideful, it's going to cause us to fall as well. Uh, I think of, turn over to 2 um, uh, Chronicles chapter 26. And I think, uh, you know, I also was thinking of Paul and Barnabas had a sharp contention over John Mark. And they ended up splitting up. They wanted to take somebody else with them. But, you know, they, they ended up splitting up and each taking somebody different with them. <coughs> but I have to wonder about that situation if that wasn't maybe pride on either of the, the, the apostle or Barnabas. I don't know. But um, they definitely had strong opinions about it. And, and you know, 
they split up and uh, went different directions, and it was a sharp contention. And so that could have been pride that brought that. Um, you know, I, I don't know for sure. Second Chronicles tells shows us King Uzziah, and man, this was a prideful thing. Pride will lead you to do things that you shouldn't, and then you stand up and and defend your actions. That's pride. That's pride. To boldly declare that what you did is good, even though God says it's wrong, that's pride, okay? To make rationalizations and to, to, to say, well, it's not really a big deal, that's pride. When God clearly says it's wrong. In verse uh, 16, 2 Chronicles 16, that's in the Old Testament. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. That lifted up means pride. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And as Uriah, the, the priest went in after him and with him four score priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord. Basically saying, look, you're not a priest. This is not your job. God literally gave uh, some different authorities, the realms of authority. You're, you're, uh, God's allowed a king in this country, so you're in charge over here, okay? But the priesthood is over here, and they're the ones that are, you know, going between God and man with the sacrifices and the incense and all of these things. He said, this is not for you, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth. I mean, his reaction, it was what? Pride. Like, what? I'm the king here, buddy. Who do you think you are? You don't come here and tell me. I mean, he stood down by, like, all these priests. Like, this is wrong. But here's what happened. Pride leads to destruction. Pride leads to contention, number one, and then it leads to destruction, as is the kind of overall theme of this sermon. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even arose up in his forehead before the, the chief priests and all the, pri uh, uh, and all the priests looked upon him. I'm sorry. Yeah, here we go. And behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper until the day of his death and dwelt in a, in a, se in a several house being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord and Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. King Uzziah's pride led him to usurp authority and to go beyond his authority as a king. And God judged him for that. Resulting in God's judgment here upon him, it was pride that brought the contention. It was pride that brought his destruction. And he, he's like, had he repented? Had he said, you know what? I was out of line. I overstepped my authority. I, I messed up. God probably would have had uh, mercy upon him. But how often when we mess up and we, we instead of admitting and repenting, uh, how often do we not, do, do we mess up? I mean, think about this. You know, you can mess up a marriage. You can mess up in your personal life. You mess up on your job. If you can't come to reality that you were wrong and you just defend a wrong position, there's going to be judgment for that. And it can bring destruction. You know, and we need to, we need to be humble and we need to admit when we're wrong. He was wrong. Pride will often bring contention where there doesn't have to be any. The king was clearly in the wrong, but pride kept him from seeing, seeing it that, that way. So Uzziah as king, you know, basically possibly corrupted him. And that's why I just, I'm so afraid of these centralized powers of authority. You guys have heard me preach about that. But, it, you know, you get these people that, that up there have so much power over other people and all of that. Guess what? You know, the, the you know, the, uh, not the Bible, but um, one of the fathers of our country said, you know, power corrupts, right? And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, the king was in the wrong, but pride kept him from seeing it clearly. And the position of Uzziah as king possibly corrupted him and made him think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And as for us, when we're prideful we can't, and can't admit that we're wrong, it will bring fights and contention in our lives that don't need to be there. 
right? This can hurt marriages. It can hurt relationships with kids. It can hurt relationships at church. It can hurt your relationship at work. We need to be honest with ourselves and try to seek because, you know, this brings us to my next point, but pride brings blindness. Pride brings blindness. Pride blinds us in several significant ways. You know, so when I say blindness, what am I talking about? I'm talking about perception. I'm talking about the ability to reflect on our own actions and, and understand, like, you know, have a self-awareness of what, how other people see us, right? Have you ever met somebody that's just a habitual liar and they can't even, like, see that everybody knows them as a habitual liar? It's a sad thing. But they're pridefully telling you all kinds of stuff and they think you believe them and you're just like... After, after they leave, you're just rolling your eyes like, well, that was, I've known people like that. And you'd say, just take that with a grain of salt as soon as they leave, you know, and you hate that. But that's, you know, that's true. It's a blindness. But this can impact our perception, our behavior. And, you know, this ultimately impacts our relationship with others. And so let me tell you a few ways that pride brings blindness in, in our life. And, and this is, so I, I'm, I'm, I started out with like talking about the national pride of, you know, how wicked it is to just celebrate a pride month where, you know, you have sexual deviants just saying like, we, we deny God and we, we just love evil, love, filth and vileness and, and garbage and, and uh, you hate purity and righteousness and all of that. But what about us? You know, personally, we can begin to think we're better than other people. We can, start, we can start thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Or, or you know, when it comes to the Bible, when we're like, you know what, I go to church, but that Bible, I'm not going to really live by that or think, you know, put that in a high place in my life. You know, you're, you're basically thinking you're, you know better than God. That's pride. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, so we need to look to the Word of God and, and, and humbly say, you know, God, I need you to show me how to live my life. I, can, I, I don't know, right? Uh, we, are, we, we are experts at deceiving ourselves and rationalizing every situation and thinking we're right in so many ways. But, but pride brings blindness in our life. Number one, pride blinds us to our own faults. Turn over to Luke chapter 18. And while you're turning there, I want you to think about the story in Matthew chapter 7 where you have a man who has a beam in his own eye. We're talking like a big board uh, in his eye. But he's, he begins to point out the faults and the failures of other people. And they're a lot smaller than his own problem in his eye, right? The, they, they have like a, basically Jesus attributed it to like a little tiny sliver or a splinter in his, somebody else's eye. But he, they, they've got the, the equivalent of a, a telephone pole sticking out of their eye. And isn't it true that, that pride would make us, you know, magnify other people's problems, other people's shortcomings, and then minimize our faults and failures, right? That's pride. We begin to, to look at other people and we think of ourselves, you know, as better than them, and that's wrong. Pride will blind us to our own faults. And pride will make us less aware of our own shortcomings and will make us more likely to justify, you know, wrong attitudes and actions on our own behalf. We become resistant to uh, criticism from, from people, you know, and we need to be careful how we give criticism. But there is criticism that, that is designed to help. I mean, you know, the Bible gives us pastors and teachers and so forth. Uh, the Bible commands there to be this reproving, rebuking, and ex exhortation uh, you know, th that he says to give with long suffering you know, in the church. So there is to be preaching and teaching that's help that we need for personal growth. But we will never grow if we're prideful and can never take any advice or any uh, knowledge or wisdom from somebody else. If we're always just like, I'm the know-it-all, I know everything. And, and we, it causes us to be, to bl be blind. So the, the Pharisee and the publican is a good example here in Luke chapter 18, verse 9. And he said, he spake this parable unto certain which, uh, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. But notice this, and despised others. Now there's your pride, right? They, were, they thought, man, we're the greatest. You know, we do all these things. We got our, our life down pat. But then 
you know, they hated other people. They looked down their nose. They were like, ugh, I'm glad. Notice how it played out. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican is looking over at this guy and he's thinking this, saying this, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off, he would not lift up his eyes so much, uh, 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 so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself uh, shall be exalted. You see in the Lord's Prayer a humility, right? As, as we pray for forgiveness, as we forgive other people, as we pray for our daily bread, we pray for you know, God's mercy and His will to be done and all of these types of things. That's our prayer. Is not pridefully like, Lord, look at all the things I've done for you. you know, I deserve you to do this for me or anything. That's not how we find grace in, in the Lord's sight. Especially, well, you know, like this guy's like, well, I'm glad, dear God, you know, uh, you know, so-and-so in the church isn't as faithful as me, you know, and, and they got a blessing from God. They got a gift. They got this or got that. Well, you know, I think you should do more for me. That's pride, isn't it? And that causes you to, to see other people's faults as bigger and, and so forth and minimize your own. The Pharisee's pride made him see, you know, other people's sin, but blind to his own sin. But the, the sin of self-righteousness and the sin of pride was so glaring in this guy just by his prayer. And it's a sin to be, to be prideful. It's a sin. Pride will blind us not only to that, but it'll also cause us to, to uh, you know, it, it'll, it'll blind us to the value of other people as we lift ourselves up in pride. We'll, we'll see other people as, as worse. And turn over to Esther chapter 5. Pride can lead us to look down on others. You know, the story in Esther... We see, you know, Haman, uh, his pride is, you know, uh, hindered. He's hurt. You know, like, why didn't this guy bow down? Why didn't this guy kneel when I came by? And he's looking at this guy like, you know, I expect to be, taught, you know, looked to or, or treated with respect and all of this kind of thing. And, you know, I believe that this will often hinder, you know, our ability to have good relationships you know, because people get their pride hurt, and then guess what? You know, oh, well, they, they hurt my feelings. They said this. They didn't give me the respect or whatever that I deserve. You know, I deserve better than this. And all of a sudden, there becomes this resentment and self-pity that just becomes to just fester, and it turns into bitterness, and it's, it's all rooted in what? Pride. Pride. And we need to be careful about this. And you know what it ends up ultimately doing? Destroying yourself. Okay, Esther chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Then went Haman forth that day joyful and glad with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up, nor moved for him. He was full of indignation. Like, why did this guy get up? Show some respect for me. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. And when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife, and Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he advanced him above the princes uh, and the servants of the king. And Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in uh, with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow I am invited unto her also with the king. But yet all this availeth me nothing. So long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then uh, said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, Let the gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. We've been around these types of people, right, that, that just brag about themselves. They lift themselves up. They promote themselves and all of that kind of thing. And, but it really just bothered him when somebody else didn't, you know, just, oh, I just, you know, like worship at his feet. And just like lift him up and say you're the greatest and all of that. And uh, we, he sets a trap. 
through this story, you know the story. Turn over to chapter 7. I'll just give you like the, the thought here. I'm not going to go through all of it. But he sets a trap. He has a, a gallows built, but it was his own destru- to his own destruction. In verse number 9 of Esther chapter 7, And, and Harbona, one of the chamberlains, uh, said unto the, before the king, Behold, also the gall- gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, uh, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him thereon. And so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. So without going through the whole story, Haman's pride led him to, de- to de- want to destroy Mordecai. And, you know, he ended up wanting to destroy all of, the, the, of God's people there in that land. And, but he also, it just blinded him, right? It was his pride uh, as... as He's invited to the banquet. He couldn't even see the trap was actually being laid for him. It was pride that was blinding him to the whole situation. And, uh, and, and, and hatred, too, um, led to this downfall. I think these are just some stories, real quick, that, that show us that, that you know, pride will blind us as we will, you know, to, to not value others, to look down at other people and, and to, as we lift ourselves up. Number three, pride blinds us to God's authority and his ultimate control in our life. Pride, look over at Daniel chapter four. Pride makes us believe that we're in control and that we, you know, we don't need God. You know, hopefully nobody in here would say that. But that's sometimes how we live if we're not seeking him in prayer and seeking his wisdom and starting our day with prayer and, and seeking God throughout the day and uh, making big decisions by prayer, that's pride. My friends, we can't take a breath without God. People live a life uh, where we, we just consider ourselves in control of our own life and our own destiny and we don't need God. This is an, an illusion, right? This is a self-sufficiency that will lead us away from relying on God's guidance and and grace in our life. In Daniel chapter 4, we read about Nebuchadnezzar's pride and his blindness. Even after he had been shown the truth uh, through several miracles, we find this. Let's look down at verse 29. And the end of the 12 months, uh, at the end of the 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the king kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall de- drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will." The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. I love that story. But he, just as he gets his the words out of my mouth, his mouth, he's like, I'm the greatest. I literally built the greatest country in the world. It's so amazing. Look at this, everything I did. And then boom, God just says, I am the Lord. I made you. I made everything in this country. I gave you all the abilities. And he took his mind directly away from him at that moment. And the man is literally out in, like, he's like, has a beast spirit. And he's out there eating grass like a cow. He's just like, just living outside in, in the wilderness for seven long years. This blindness, Nebuchadnezzar's pride, had blinded him to the power of God. Now think about the things that he had seen, right? I mean, he he had seen the fourth man in the fire. He had heard the testimonies of Daniel as he gave him, uh, uh, not only told him what his, like the interpretation of a dream, but he also told him what the dream was. Because have you ever had a dream you can't remember what it was? And it's just like right there on your tip of your tongue, and you feel like you'd like to remember what it was. That's what the king had. And, you know, he brought in all the astrologers and soothsayers and witches and warlocks and all of them. And they're like, King, what? You want us to tell us what your dream was and the interpretation? But God told Daniel, and he was able to actually do that. 
And he, he proved that all those were a bunch of con men and con artists, and they didn't have the power of God. He'd seen all these things, that, that there is a God, okay, that there is one true God. He even admitted such earlier in the book. But then he just got lifted up in pride and literally just said, you know what, I did all this. Look at all the stuff I've done. Look at me. And God was just like, you know what? Talk about blindness coming upon him. This blindness was before his blind, the second blindness. But he attributed the greatness of Babylon to his own power and majesty, ignoring God's role in, in allowing this to happen and, and making it happen. Nebuchadnezzar's pride in his own achievements binded him, blinded him to God's ultimate authority, and everything comes from God. Had he humbled him, he, he had, been, had to be humbled dramatically before he came to the conclusion. And if you remember, he finally said, the most high God ruleth in the kingdom of men. And so not only that, but pride um, brings destruction in this and it, and it blinds us. <coughs> but Sorry about that. It pride blinds us to reality, to risks. You know, you, you say, well, what are you talking about? Well, pride leads us to overconfidence, right? And there's a false sense of security. You know, we get a little experience, and we get a little bit of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, life experience and all of this and some training and things like that. And we get this attitude, well, that could never happen to me. I, I could never, that, I would, that would never happen here or something like that. But this blindness can prevent us for, from seeing the potential dangers and uh, making prudent, wise decisions with our life. It, it could cause us to live recklessly. I mean, a great example of this is, is the Titanic. You know, we all have heard the story of this incredible ship that was built. But the Titanic was literally considered the ship that someone had said, I think it made a headline, a ship that even God could not sink. You guys have heard of that before? You know, let's not use that kind of phraseology because God just might sink your ship, you know. I mean, you, you start talking like that, God just might make an example out of you, you know. But this belief, you know, this pridefully saying this, I mean, it was an engineering marvel. It was an amazing ship, but they had a long way to go. You know, it's hard to sink a ship these days. You have to really mess up to sink a ship these days. You know, uh, we've got people, Marines, and they get on boats sometimes, and uh, they've got different locks. They could, you, they could take a torpedo in several, you know, they're, they're not going to be sunk very easily. They have different, they can lock down the ship right up to the very top almost. And um, it takes a lot more to sink a ship. Uh, but anyway, the Titanic was considered unsinkable. But this led to just, you know, a, I would say they, they did not take adequate measures of safety, uh, keeping the safety of the crew and, the, and the, the passengers in mind and all of that. And um, I think this pride uh, in human ingenuity, like, the, you know, God, it, it, it caused several critical problems and the loss of lives. I mean, you guys have read the story, know, know the story. Do you know that, that there was only a small fraction of lifeboats on the, on the ship? I mean, what was it, a third of the lifeboats? Uh, for the were there a third of the lifeboats for for every they weren't there for the passengers. You have a um, only a third of the people could fit on lifeboats. That's kind of prideful. It could never happen to this ship, you know. Um, I mean, there were iceberg warnings, uh, and they were in icy water, and they had been given warnings about it, like this is a dangerous, treacherous area. And yet they went at full speed through there at breakneck speed because they were trying to beat a record. You know, the, the uh, transatlantic um, crossing record. And then, you know, there was a, a, a complacency. There was a belief that the ship is just unsinkable. And so there was just a, a lack of urgency in responding to this collision. And there's just, I, it seemed like, the way it sounded like there were people that just, it took a while for people to grasp like how bad this was as the ship's going down for hours, you know. And I, I talk about, I like the story of the Titanic. It's fascinating to me. And my favorite story out of all is the story of John Harper, the soul-winning Baptist on that ship 
for the, the several hours as the ship's going down, he's going person to person trying to get them saved, even yelling out, let the women, children, and unsaved onto the lifeboats as he's helping people to get on the boats. Anyway, that's a, an, another one. But this was just pride, right? And, and when the Titanic struck the iceberg on that April 14th in 1912, this unsinkable ship was damaged and, and just basically sank within just a few hours. And 1,500 of the 2,224 of the passenger and crew perished. I mean, it, it's just a, a, a catastrophe. And, you know, from that, they've made a lot of changes to the rules of, of travel on the ocean. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that they do now. But, but I think this is a story that proves to, to show how pride blinds us to reality and risks. And, you know, the creators and the operators, they just, they thought, man, we've got the greatest technology. We've got all of these advancements. And it caused them to do some reckless things. And we need to be careful about that. Pride will cause us to do some reckless things as well. Uh, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know, national pride is going to lead to destruction. I'm telling you. We, we think, well, we have, we've never, you know, we always win the wars. Yeah, well, we're going we're gonna, to uh, take a dog by the ear sometime and then get, we're going to get nuked one of these days. We're going to, some, some country that has like, you know, 15 times the, the population of us is going to invade us or something. And it's going to be a different story. Hey, we need to, some national humility and not some national pride. Okay? Well, it can't happen here. That's pride. And pride goes before destruction. So pride will foster this overconfidence in our own abilities, our own uh, work, our own, our own uh, training and all of this. And it can lead to a catastrophic failure. This should remind us to stay humble and vigilant and aware of our limitations. And, um, you know, and, and ultimately, we need to acknowledge that our life depends on God. You know, the, we, we, we work hard, we, we prepare hard and all of that. How, what is the Bible verse? Uh, a horse is prepared for the day of battle, but the, uh, how does it go? How does it go? Somebody, safety is of the Lord. There it is. The outcome's in, in God's hands, you know. Um, only God is, is infallible. Only God doesn't make any mistakes. Have you ever had this happen in sports? You know? Have, have you ever seen a sport where people get cocky? They're like way ahead, and they start playing a sport, and they're like, they get way ahead, and then they just start, they start, they're cocky. And then guess what happens? You'll have, the other team will come back and destroy them. And it's like, what happened? You guys, what did you do? They got cocky. I mean, you know, we'll play some board games. We'll play chess or something with the kids. And I'll, I'll just, you know, like I'll get ahead. I'll, I'll take a queen or something like that. But it's come back on me. Yeah. It's like I, get, I got prideful. I got cocky. Like, I got this. What is this? I'm not even I'm going to pay half attention. I, got, I could do this with, my, with, with what was that, that radio guy he used to say? With half my brain tied behind my back just to make it fair. You know, I'm just so great. You know, so prideful, right? Um, that's how you lose. You know, you get a little advantage. Oh, you start thinking yourself, it's just psychology, right? We, we lose. As we get better in life, we get more skills, more experience, we get more confidence and all of that. And, and I understand that. But ultimately, we got to stay humble because, you know, we are just a short way from failure. Our lives are in God's hands ultimately. And the most dangerous place, I mean, honestly, we, we've got to stay humble. We need to remember to pray and stay close to God and not trust in the arm of our flesh, the Bible says. Because the arm of our flesh will fail us. When you get up in the morning, you need to tell the Lord you are relying on Him today to go to your job and do your job in the best way possible. Because you know what? You're one step from just messing everything up at work and destroying your career. You're just one step from messing things up uh, in your home. You know, you're just one step and you go down the route of pride, you know, and not stay humble and not seek God's help and not seek God's, God's way. You're on your way to disaster. And we need to think of that that way. We're, we're breaths away from disaster this morning. You know, your life could tra tragically change just overnight, you know, and we're not promised tomorrow. So we need to be humble and rely 
on the Lord. I, I'm, sp- I'm going to just give you a couple more thoughts here. Pride blinds us to true wisdom. It blinds us to wisdom. How many people have stopped their ears to wise counsel because they know better? And it's because of pride, right? The Bible says in Proverbs 11, 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. I think you need to meditate on that verse. Maybe write it down. I need to meditate on it. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. This verse is showing us the the difference between pride and humility. Pride says, I know it all and nobody needs to tell me anything. I've been everywhere. I've done everything. I know it all. But humility, you know, and that leads to shame. But humility brings wisdom. Humility is, is the beginning, the place where you begin to learn and understand. You, you know, you realize how much you don't know, right? And you realize how, like, yeah, you may know a lot, but there's a lot you don't know. And it's pride to think you know everything and that, or that you got every, everything figured out, okay? And there are, there are things that you don't know and you don't know you don't know because you're prideful, or I am, you know? And, and pride will cause you to resist things uh, that, would, that, that may be true that would come to you. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 33, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Humility is depicted as the prerequisite for honor. Humility. This is counter to the world today. Uh, they say it's pride, pride, pride. But this is, that's not what the Bible says. By humbling ourselves and fearing the Lord, we gain w- true wisdom. And this reverence and humility posis- positions us to receive from God wisdom that is from above. We're, we're humble. That's when we can receive. But you know, it goes in other things as well, right? You know, sometimes... Like, there are going to be people that know more about something than us. And we need to be able to listen to other points of view and be humble about that. And the Bible says this in Proverbs 22, 4, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. By humility and the fear of the Lord. Pride will keep us from, you know, going to where, you know, getting the knowledge and the wisdom that we need to succeed in life to succeed on our job, to succeed with our marriage, with our uh, raising kids, to succeed at whatever ministry God's given to us. Pride can cause us uh, to be blinded to wisdom that helps us to grow. And I mean, think about that. Hum- it's by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Have you read that in a self-help book lately? Did you get that from, you know, uh, Donald Trump's self-help book or Robert Kiyosaki or anything, by fear of the Lord and humility, that's where riches, honor, and life come from. That's the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord. James 3.13, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. We- meekness is not weakness. It is, it, it is uh, strength, but in humility. True wisdom is demonstrated through meekness, which is another form of humility. A wise person shows their understanding through, uh, through humble and good behavior. And then let me just give you another one here, and I'll close with this. Turn over to 1 Kings 3. Pride will blind us to, to our need for humility. We're supposed to stay humble. But pride, you know, is, is a saying like, no, I don't need that. I don't need to be humble. But I love this, this idea. Now, Solomon got puffed up. You know, the Bible does say knowledge puffeth up. But his heart was right in his request. His heart was right in his request. Solomon here was, you know, being given the, 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 the job of leading people, leading a great nation of people. Now, if you have been given a position of leadership, whether it's a father or even a mother over children. I'm a pastor. Uh, maybe you're, you're uh, a leader, you know, in the military or something like that. You know, we, I, I heard we just had a promotion, brother. God bless you. Amen. Amen. 
You know, like that's that's there's some serious things there for you to think about. Now Solomon, he he actually showed some serious humility here. Notice what the Bible says, and now, O Lord, verse 7, 1 Kings 3, 7, and now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor, or, nor counted for multitude. Give therefore my, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy, uh, thy so great a people? I mean, this is actually, you know, you say, well, that's not a befitting attitude for a king. It is. I mean, you know, a king acknowledging that he cannot do anything, like he's, he's like, he comes short and he needs God's help. That's a great, great attribute. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing, and God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thy, th thyself long life, neither had asked for riches for thyself, nor had asked the life of thine enemies, but thou hast asked thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a, a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like unto thee, be, uh, thee, thee before thee, neither shall there, there be any that arise like unto thee. So Solomon, he requested wisdom. He's like, I can't do this on my own. And I think every single one of us needs to come to this realization that we can't do it. Like, you know, my kids need my leadership, and I, I don't know how to lead them without God helping me. You know, this church needs my leadership, and I don't know how to lead this church without God helping me. I need that wisdom that's from above. And some of you men might be leaders at your job, maybe at the military, but you don't know how to do it without God helping you. Pride, pride will blind us to the, our need for humility. Pride blinds us to our own faults, the, values of, uh, the value of others. God's ultimate authority and power and, and the reality and risks uh, that, that, are, that are facing us. It'll cause us to do destructive things, thinking, oh, that'll never happen to us. It, it, it will blind us to true wisdom. It'll blind us to our, our need for humility. And pride will create a barrier between us and the truth. And it'll also lead us to make poor decisions. It'll bring a barrier in our relationships, broken relationships, and it will ultimately bring our downfall. The Bible consistently warns against pride and commands us to be humble, to, to follow after wisdom. And if we can recognize and address the blindness caused by pride, we can lead more righteous, you know, have more righteous and fulfilling lives. Amen. Being led by the Lord and His Holy Spirit and His Word. But if we're prideful... Bible says, pride goeth before destruction. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just love you so much, Lord, as we're taking time, God, to talk about pride. You have so much to say about pride and how we're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to just live uh, understanding, knowing that you are in control of our lives and we're supposed to seek your ultimate wisdom and, and authority and power in our lives, God, calling upon you for every need and every shortcoming in our own life, seeing ourselves as inadequate, Lord, and you as completely all-powerful, God, and relying upon you. And Lord, I pray uh, that we would, Lord, just, Lord, would you just break through the blindness that has crept into to maybe my heart and many others' heart, Lord, through pride. And Lord, help us to be humble, God, to, to search, serve you and to serve other people, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, putting other people down and all of that. Help us to not be blinded by pride, but to serve you with all our heart and seek your wisdom first. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, let's stand together. We'll sing our closing chorus. I'm determined, I've made up my mind, I'll serve the Lord.